Okay, uh, go ahead to the next slide because we know we're new in the area. Uh, and I always am interested about where people come from because uh, if you come from the northern area, you'll know more about the sun location and so you're familiar with that but may not be able to um, winter over uh, some of your plants and products so that may be a question. Uh, if you're from the south uh, and I've got I've gardened in South Carolina maybe you can't grow broccoli maybe you don't want to grow broccoli. Um, from the east uh, you you're questioning what is this no humidity uh, because our humidity here compared to the East Coast is very low and that's going to affect growing vegetables also. And most of my talk today is going to be about vegetables and fruits uh, and berries because to get into trees, bushes, and shrubs along with that is going to take another four hours. And I'm not the best person to, to ask questions on that. So we're going to concentrate on um, fruits and berries and mostly vegetables. Uh, the West, uh, a lot of folks coming out from California or Arizona, or those places don't know and haven't dealt with clay <coughs> soil, so that's another <coughs> issue. Uh, and the Midwest, uh, I lived in Ohio, so the highest mountain you had in the Midwest was the overpass. So uh, elevation is going to be an issue for a lot of people also. So go ahead, Gary, next, next slide. So think about where you're coming from and what your issues might be and what, your, uh, uh, what you know about your old way of gardening and what you may have to change with the new way of gardening. And here are the things that we're going to consider. Uh, um, type of soil in Cowlitz County, we've got a lot of clay. Uh, although there are some areas like down by the river that has a lot of sand. So it's not, it's typical, but it's not everywhere. Uh, sun location, um, our location in the wintertime of where the sun comes up and where it goes down is going to be totally different from um, the summertime when, you, when you're when you doing most of your gardening. Type of client, climate, we'll talk about that a little bit because we, uh, we do have a specific type. Day and night temperatures are going to be uh, different, especially if you're used to humidity because that, that's going to be a wide swing. We have different pests here also, and we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit, although not um, in total. And the diseases and weeds, and then of course, location, 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 which not only deals with your house, but it also deals with your garden. Next slide. Majority of uh, soil here is clay. If you have dug into it at all and you find that that's the case, uh, I feel for you because I've got the same thing. Um, I could almost make pottery out of my soil. It's, it's got so much clay in it. And when you do decide to amend the soil or if you, if you do decide to amend the soil and you're growing things in the ground, um, don't deal with just sand. You can absolutely um, supplement with sand, but if you put just sand in to break up the clay, you're going to wind up with concrete. So uh, just like a person, a human being, roughage for your soil. Uh, roughage is good for your soil also. So uh, your compost, chopped up leaves, chopped up straw, uh, garden goodies, whatever you can throw in there to decompose uh, is going to be uh, what you need to amend that soil. And there are um, um, different amendments that you can get from your nursery and we have different locations that have good garden soil amendments. One of the best places I've found is Castle Rock and the four in one soil. Uh, and that seems to be a really good blend of garden soil. Um, there is another a company in Longview that has what they consider garden soil, but I've had hit and miss with that. So it. I have to write that down. But... Yeah. Um, it's sometimes it's great and sometimes it's not great. So, um, best thing to do is blend everything up so you have uh, a more complex 
situation as far as soil goes. And we've got a class on soil, so you might think about taking that. So it's, it's a good way to get started. Soil here tends to be acidic. You look at all the fir trees and the pine trees and yep, it's acidic. Uh, get it tested uh, because you don't know what the level is. Ours isn't too bad uh, here at my property, but I've heard of other people who, who it's, you know, 5.5 or 6 and it's, uh, they need to uh, amend that quite a bit to bring it up. So soil test, not only for acidity, but also for trace elements. Uh, great idea. And guess what? We also have a class on that. Um, some of the options that we're going to uh, consider are raised beds and containers, because if you have a raised bed, you're going to do a couple things and a container. You're going to not only be able to control that soil, but you're also going to be able to control the moisture and the heat and um, the crews, uh, more or less. So it has several benefits. Now, in raised beds, uh, you can make them out of just about anything. We've got ours made out of cinder block. And for me personally, um, the cinder block works really well because I stack them too high and I can sit down and I can weed. And that, that helps with um, physical labor and, and trying to get down to the, the plants physically. Uh, it also makes it easier to put a row cover over it or anything to protect it. Um, and you can put irrigation in it and you can have a, a better um, control over what you're trying to do. Containers, uh, I did a lot of containers this year, mainly because um, I grew too many tomato plants. I'll just admit it right here. Uh, <laughs> I grew, and it was for a good cause. It was I was going to donate them to the plant sale, which didn't happen. So I had about 30 tomato plants, and so I had big buckets and, and uh, things to put the tomato plants in, and they did extremely well. I also grew my peppers and my eggplant and carrots in buckets. And they did well. And I grew celery for the first time in buckets, and it did well. And uh, the <laughs> I've never grown celery before, but I went ahead and and uh, grew that. And um, because celery likes a bog, and I have sunny spots, but the sunny spots that I have on my property don't have a boggy ground, so. And the boggy ground that I have is down the hill in the forest in the wooded area, but there's no sun. So I put a tray of gardening tray out with water in it and put a couple buckets of celery in it and they did great. So if you're going to real challenge, uh, grow celery. Next slide. Sun location, okay. We're further north in parts of Canada. How does that feel? Uh, if you're from Minnesota, you don't care. If you're from California or Arizona or Southeast US, uh, you do care uh, because your winter arc and your summer arc are going to be different. So if you've got fir trees and you're shaded in the winter time with the fir trees, you may not be shaded in the summertime. If you've got a building, uh, we have a building that we've done here uh, and I planted my raised beds on the north side of the building. And you think, well, that's crazy because you're not going to get any sun. But the sun ra rises so high in from just about May through August that um, I get full sun. So the building doesn't matter and the trees might not matter. You just have to look at your summer arc and winter arc and where do they go. Now I won't plant uh, broccoli or peas or my spring crops in those boxes, but I can plant short time summer crops like squash and tomatoes. Remember I said I had a lot of tomatoes. 
uh, and even beans. Uh, I had a uh, bumper crop of beans in those boxes, but it's because uh, they could get full sun when I wanted to plant them in the beds and when I needed to harvest. So take a look at your buildings and your trees and everything, and um, that sun is going to change location in the summertime. Days and nights, um, your days are going to be warm in the summertime, but your nights are going to be cool. And that has to do not necessarily with sun location, although when you have a long day in the, in the summertime, it, it is going to warm up in the daytime, but your nights are going to be cool. So if you're used to humidity and you uh, are used to a warmer nighttime, I know in South Carolina, we had nighttime temperatures that were upper 70s. Uh, and my corn and my uh, tomatoes and my hot weather crops, okra, cotton, peanuts, all of them love that temperature. But here, I, I'd be hard pressed to grow some of that. Now, it's, it's not impossible, but you're gonna have to plan for it. And the sun location in the wintertime is going, definitely gonna be much, much lower. So if you're planning on a fall crop, because we have the long uh, springs and the long falls, and you thought, well, I can, I can put in a fall crop and we can get this going again. Um, you're gonna have to plan extra time on that because the sun will, you'll be missing a lot of the sun as it, as it goes down in the fall and the winter time. So growing those plants will be much slower. That makes sense so far? Okay, on to the next slide. Believe it or not, we're in some place called the Northern Mediterranean climate. Uh, and Mediterranean to me is misleading, but honestly we are. It goes as far north as British Columbia. So all that means is we have hot, dry summers and cool, wet winters. And I'm not hearing it. Say that again. I think it was just interference from outside. Oh, okay, okay. Most of our uh, temperatures in this county are going to be G2 and there is another one there, but it has to do with the mountainous areas, so it may be, it may be G1. It's cooler, colder in the winter, and not quite as warm in the summer. So um, the mountains are going to have an awful lot to do with your temperatures and, um, and how you grow things, but we're considered a northern Mediterranean climate. I'll give everybody time to figure out where the heck they are. And, when, and you know, you notice Portland is, I think, an F2 instead of a G2. Mm -hmm. So the F2 actually is a warmer area. And when I first started gardening here, I started gardening in Portland in the 70s. And I thought, well, this isn't too bad. I can grow corn, I can grow beans, I can grow tomatoes. The soil is nice because we were in the Willamette Valley. Well, Callas County is just north of the Willamette Valley. And so everything that happens in the Willamette Valley didn't happen to us. So the soil is different and the temperatures are a little bit different. So if you're coming from the Portland area, it, it's gonna be a little bit different. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. Next slide. I like that map, by the way. Uh, the humidity makes a difference, and we talked a little bit about the day-night temperatures, where it's it can go up to 100 degrees here in the summertime. Um, it, it may go down to the 60s because of low humidity. So that's going to be a little bit different than if you're coming in from Ohio or the southeast or even... Um, anywhere where the, the humidity is a little bit higher, Minnesota and East, I think we're looking at. Uh, so it does make a difference in the speed in which your uh, 
produce or your plants will grow. Your tomatoes will be a little slower um, because of the day night temperatures and the wide swing in those temperatures. Your peppers will be slower. Eggplant will be slower. All of those things will be slower in growing because the temperature drops so much and they don't have that residual heat in the nighttime. Um, seed catalogs. I, I threw this in here because um, we're so used to buying seeds from seed catalogs and everybody has their favorites. And I tend to get my seeds from the catalogs that are the companies that are here in the Northwest. Although I get a lot of uh, seeds from Baker Creek. And uh, when I do that, I take a look at the dates to maturity and I reduce it by about five days or so because they're used to growing things and it's a quicker growth or it takes less time to grow those seeds than it does out here. So uh, when you are ordering your seeds, just keep that in mind. If you order from Gurney's or um, Burpees or even Baker Creek, take a look at the date to maturity. And then if you want, compare them to the same um, variety, uh, maybe in a seed catalog here in the Northwest and plan accordingly because the, the dates will be different. So day night temperatures um, will make a difference. Next slide. Dear oh dear. And this, this is my buddy Fred. <laughs> I found Fred marching towards my garden. So I picked Fred up and put him in another location, threw him deep in the woods where he can munch on other slugs to his heart content. I think this is a leopard slug. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. Okay. And leopard slugs will eat other slugs, but the caveat is when they're done eating other slugs, they'll eat your garden. And this sucker was, oh, he was about six or seven inches long. So he was, he was real healthy, very friendly, but very healthy. Uh, what's common here, if you haven't already run into it, are slugs and snails. And the snails, I never ran into snails in the 70s. I think they've come in, and we have some natives here. I just never ran into them. Uh, but they're more prevalent now that we have plants coming in from other locations. So be aware of that. Aphids, uh, that's a common problem, especially in the fall and especially on Brussels sprouts. Just, just saying. Uh, cabbage butterfly. Now, you all hear about the cabbage moth. This is the same critter, but it really is a butterfly because it flies in the daytime and its little wings are are up and not out, and uh, but people just don't like it, so they call it a moth. It's the most common butterfly in the world, if that's any consolation. Leaf miner, which um, destroyed my beet greens one year. Uh, we couldn't eat any beet greens because they were just, I mean, they were just lace. And voles uh, or mice tend to run, um, underground and they'll use um, runways or they'll create their own. They'll use the moles runways and they'll they'll uh, create havoc in your in your beds. And of course the moles are here also but they don't tend to eat vegetables. They'll eat bugs and worms and things like that, but the voles will get in their runways and you will find that your potatoes and other root vegetables are half eaten. So uh, just be aware of that and uh, you may have you may have to do something about that when you're building your garden. What's not common here, and here's the good news, uh, tomato hornworm. I don't think I've ever seen one here. And squash borer, I can't remember if I've seen one, but they're not common. And cucumber beetle, I've, I think I've seen a couple, um, but not much. And those are the major uh, common pests on the East Coast or on the, in, in other areas. So they're not common here. You're going to have to worry about other things, but not those. 
And of course the deer, if you are in an area where deer can get to, and that includes the suburbs, um, and once they find your garden, they'll, they'll wanna come out, come out at over and over again. So be aware of deer, I'm sure you are. Everybody in the US is aware of deer. Next slide. <laughs> okay, diseases and weeds. Um, all I can say about diseases is that we have a wonderful plant and insect clinic. And we frequently, you can post on Facebook, we have a Facebook presence. So rather than getting into diseases, which you're probably not going to remember too much anyway, I'm going to say if you come across something like a virus or uh, the leaves are dying or your apples are looking really horrendous like mine did this year, contact WSU and the Plant and Insect Clinic and they can get you straightened out. Uh, OSU also has a good presence, so uh, either one of those will do. But I prefer WSU just because I'm prejudiced. Weeds, we have a lot of weeds. Um, the main ones to look for are horsetail, which I have pictured here, uh, which is a weed that you're not going to eradicate. You can manage it, but you can't eradicate it. Um, it just, it's been here since prehistoric times and it's going to remain and that's just the way it goes. Uh, blackberry, the Himalayan blackberry uh, came here in the 60s, uh, was brought over to, um, to produce nice big large berries uh, for the berry farms and of course the birds got into it and since the 60s we've had uh, a blessing of blackberries. So <laughs> harvest your blackberries and then cut them back or use crossbow on them or something, but don't do anything with them until the fall if you're going to do anything with them. Harvest those berries first anyway. Bindweed, um, which is a lot like morning glory, it's first cousin to it. Um, you'll probably, I can, won't say you probably find that, but you might find that in your yard. So that's another thing to look out. I mean, we could go on and on about weeds, but those are the th main three that I see that um, you may not be aware of. We have other blackberries. Uh, we have a mountain berry and we have a couple natives, which are very, <laughs> the vines are very gentle and they don't grow uh, all that much or all that fast and the berries are delicious. You'll know what a Himalayan blackberry is by the thickness of its stalk because the stalks can actually grow to be an inch thick and they're, they're voracious growers. They'll, they'll grow several feet in a season. So um, chances are it's a Himalayan blackberry. They are overwhelming. Okay, on to the next slide. Okay, ah. This is a picture of my plants on the north side of a large building. And you can see some of it's in the shade right now, but that's because it was the last, it was a fall time picture. The beans had already been picked. Those beans, those bean vines are up about eight or 10 feet. Uh, and I've picked so many beans off of that, that we can 40 pints or something off that one off of two towers. So it did extremely well. Uh, you can just barely see the roof of the building off on the upper right side. So that's how close it is. And that's, uh, what's that? Okay, that's the cinder block um, beds that I've got. You can see the cinder block down below. But that's, um, that's a good spot for, you know, if you can if you can get a good location that's sunny, even if it's on the north side of something, if you can get enough sun on it, you can, you can deal with it. Elevation. I've had a couple people talk to me about, I didn't know elevation was going to be a problem. And here I am up at a thousand feet and I, I'm having trouble growing things. <laughs> so elevation is going to affect um, what you grow and how you grow it. Um, on, and I understand and I hear that for every thousand feet in elevation, 
you're 200 to 500 miles north. So if you're up a thousand feet, you're essentially growing at um, Seattle, no, that's 200 feet, um, British Columbia area. So elevation is going to have a lot to do with uh, what you grow. North side and south uh, side, do you have a north facing or a south facing property? And it's going to make a lot of difference, especially if you have elevation, because if you have a south facing side in elevation, you can work that slope in so the the sun is actually hitting at a better angle and you can actually get more heat that way than normal. So think about your, your slope, your location, and your elevation. And there is an app that you can put on your phone that has an altimeter on it and it will help you roughly guess what your elevation is if you need to know. Um, and we talked a little bit about evergreens and buildings already. So uh, those are shrubs or those are trees and buildings that are going to be shading year round. If you have trees that are deciduous and you, you plant near them, <coughs> you can actually use those trees for a springtime planting because they won't leaf out until the 1st of May. So for peas and lettuces and uh, things that are short-term spring plants, they'll work fine. And water availability, I stuck this in here because um, in some locations when you plant um, gardens, you'll have, uh, uh, you'll have your garden being watered every afternoon by a shower. And that's what we had in South Carolina, and I, I never had to water my garden. Here, because of the Mediterranean climate, we'll have um, a couple months where we get very little uh, rain. In fact, this year it was three months where we got very little rain. So make sure that you've got water nearby or you'll be carrying buckets to your gardens. Uh, of course, in the springtime, and fall, it's usually not a problem, uh, and which is good for, you know, broccolis and cabbages and, and lettuces and all of that. But don't count on it because uh, you won't always get those, those showers when you need them. So water availability at your location is going to be important. Next slide. What grows well here? Oh my goodness, it doesn't mean that you can't grow corn and tomatoes and peppers and uh, all of those things. I, I've never tried growing peanuts here and I, I don't think I want to. Uh, but it does mean that there are certain things that grow well here that may not grow well where you're coming from uh, or where you've, you've gardened before. So this is a short list of some of the things that you can grow well here. Um, and, you know, things like Swiss chard and, where's the other one? And, and the herbs uh, and hail and collards can winter over. So, and leeks. So a lot of crops, because we have a mild winter here, can actually winter over. And at my location, which is about 170 feet in elevation, I don't even put straw or leaves over it to protect it. And I, you know, unless, it, unless we're gonna go down to 20 degrees and maybe I'll think about covering things, but they'll, they'll frost over a little bit and then they're fine. Uh, so we eat a lot of this stuff into winter time. I know the leaks, uh, held until January, and then they turned a little slimy, but uh, a lot of this will hold through the, through the winter time and definitely through the fall. Uh, and I didn't put potatoes down here, uh, but they do grow well. Most of your, well, root crops, most of your root crops will go just fine here. Uh, in the berries and fruit, uh, most of the berries and fruit grow well here. The fruit, um, and of course, this is northern fruit, not necessarily peaches and nectarines and, 
apricots, although you can grow them. Uh, it's a hit and miss thing on some of them. And the berries, um, I'm trying to think if there's any berry that you can't grow here. That's not a subtropical or a tropical berry, you know, the normal uh, raspberry, blueberry, blackberry, brambleberry um, group. But this is, a, this is an area that's known for growing berries and a lot of their fruits. Now, the, having said that, um, the cherries that are grown here have a problem with pollination because when they're out in bloom, the uh, honeybees that they usually use for pollination don't make it through the rains and the mist and stuff. So now they're trying some um, experiments with native bees and they're finding that the cherries can now be grown on this side of the mountain. Most of the times they, they were grown on the east side of the mountain. You knew I would put in a plug for uh, mason bees, so there it is. Mushrooms grow exceed, exceedingly well here. In fact, I'm probably gonna be doing some mushroom hunting here pretty soon, but you know, with all the the wet spring and the wet falls, you would assume that mushrooms would do um, do fine. And I say I have root crops here twice. Sorry about that. Uh, herbs or herbs <coughs> do really well here um, in the lower elevations. I'm not sure about the upper elevations. We can grow rosemary and uh, oregano and thyme. Uh, in fact, parsley. Um, a lot of the a lot of the herbs here that my sister can't grow in Virginia because of the harsher winter times. But these will also winter over, and they'll be just fine. So um, think about growing herbs in your yard and garden. Uh, deer don't like them. Bugs don't like it. Uh, you can go out and just pick fresh herbs when you need something to go into your soups and stews and all of that. Golden marjoram grows well here, and I use that as a ground cover, so uh, all of that. In fact, um, there's probably more, but I haven't put it in yet. We're starting an, uh, an herb bed, but those I know for sure are hardy, and they will, they will winter over just fine. So we have a lot of pluses here uh, as far as what grows here, and if you're used to an area that doesn't grow a whole lot of things really well, then you're in a good spot because um, if you get the the sun right and the soil right then you can grow a lot of stuff next slide tips okay um uh, raised beds that's that's one of the things that i would absolutely suggest that somebody gets started with if they're going to grow anything at all and you see some of my tomato plants here. <laughs> uh, these are just a few. Uh, and they're in 15 gallon containers and they did extremely well. And I had to put up 50 pints of tomato sauce and V8 juice and, and all of that. And then freeze a bunch of tomatoes because I freeze tomato balls and use them during the year. Um, but the containers that you see here just make sure if you're going to try some container planting, uh, and it's really easy to do, and it, most of the time the slugs will stay out of the containers and the rabbits can't jump that high, and so it keeps a lot of critters out. Make sure the container fits the plant that you're planting in. I would not try, uh, I understand that you can use, you can put a tomato in a five gallon pot, but I want to give it a little more space, so I have a 15 gallon pot for it. My um, Pepper plants did fine in a five gallon container and the eggplant did too well in a five gallon container. So um, make sure that your plant fits whatever container you're thinking about putting it in. Plant starts. If you are from another area, try plant, try uh, growing things. Is that you? Hello? Anyway, try growing things, uh, plants from starts instead of seeds. Uh, that's not always possible, but 
um, uh, tomatoes and, and your hot weather loving plants, grow them from starts so that when you do put them in the ground, the ground is warm. One of the tips I didn't put down, but I'll stress here is just because it's warm and sunny out doesn't mean that the ground is warm. If you put your hand on the ground, it's going to feel warm. So you have to dig down a few inches where those roots are going to go and make sure that that's warmed up. Uh, if it's cold, then it's not going to do any good. And I'll tell you that if you put your plants in early and they don't like the cold weather, like tomato plants and peppers, they'll sit there and the plants that you plant later will pass them up. So make sure that your soil is warmed up. You notice that these pots have got are black. So they're warming the sun up um, better than in the ground. If you do a raised bed setup, you're going to get temperatures that are 5 to 10 degrees warmer than the ground. So uh, it will actually warm things up. Uh, if you don't care what varieties, go for the earlier varieties. Um, and so if something is 75 days or another plant is 90 days, choose the one that's 75 unless you really, really, really want that 90 day one. I have brandy wines and I had, I got beautiful brandy wines this year, but I always take a chance, but it's because I love the brandy wines so much that I, I go ahead and, and plant them and they're an 85 day tomato plants. So I'm really chancing it. But I grow them from seed and by the time I put them in the ground they are a foot high and they're ready to go. Um, and I get tomatoes off of them. So consider your variety and make sure that that, uh, that you're not going to be too long because uh, there's nothing sadder than looking at a tomato plant and seeing all green tomatoes and the rains have started. Just saying. Not that I've ever done that. Um, cover for spring. If you find that you've put things in and the weather has turned on you, then um, cover, your, cover your plants up so that they, they don't get hit with so much rain or they don't get hit with so much cold. And you can cover them for fall too. I just put spring down there because I was thinking of tomatoes. So. Um, Covering with Rime or um, I have cylinders for my tomatoes, not these, but my other tomatoes that I had, have um, fence wire that are formed into cylinders. And I can put something over the top of them so they're not beaten down by the rain or in the uh, spring when I put them out, I can actually wrap them in plastic until they've gotten used to being outside for a while and then I take the plastic off. So the, uh, they get pollinated. But you can, you can warm those things up and uh, keep them going a lot, a lot more, longer. Um, and I think that's, that's it. Check the next slide. Yep. So, questions.